Well, good morning. good morning. Welcome to Little River United Church of Christ. We offer a warm welcome to all of our visitors, our members, and our friends this morning, both in person and those who are worshiping with us online this morning. We are an open and affirming congregation, and we strive to be an anti-racist church. Whoever you are, wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. If you are worshiping with us in person, you will find a red notebook somewhere near you, maybe on the end of a pew. If you wouldn't mind filling that out, it lets us know who was worshiping with us this morning. We also invite you to stay after the service today for coffee hour in our social hall. And those who are worshiping with us online are invited to stay and talk with one another in our community. We do have a few announcements this morning. First, uh, I want to welcome our guest preacher, Jerry Foltz. Reverend Foltz is Pastor Emeritus at Wellspring UCC in Centerville and former Associate Conference Minister for the Central Atlantic Conference. So Jerry, we welcome you. We look forward to your message. Thank you for being here. This afternoon, we will be hosting our Trunk or Treat event from 3 to 5 p.m. And if the weather permits, we will have our vehicles outside to pass out candy, and we'll have games inside. If it rains, um, which I'm hoping, fingers crossed, it's going to stop drizzling by the time we get there. Um, but if it does rain, we will ask those who are planning to decorate their trunks to come inside and decorate a hall, uh, doorway in our preschool wing. So we will make it work. We'll pass out candy um, in the preschool wing if it is raining, but uh, everybody cross your fingers for dry skies by 3 p.m. Please do arrive at 2 o'clock to set up your trunk or your game. On Wednesday this week, we will have the opportunity to meet UCC of Fredericksburg and their pastor, Daryl Moak. This is a chance to let them get to know us and to hear more about them as we discern whether we would like to strengthen the ties between our two congregations. The Wednesday meeting will be held via Zoom at 6 p.m., and you'll find the link in our church communications. All Saints Day will be observed next Sunday, so if you have lost a family member or a close friend in the last 12 months, please do send their information to our office by this Wednesday so that we can include their names in our bulletin. Finally, the Interfaith Communities for Dialogue event that was scheduled here for November 5 has been postponed until the new year. So please watch for more information after the holidays. Today we observe the 506th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. On October 31, 1517, Martin Luther posted his 95 theses on the church door in Wittenberg to publicize a public disputation regarding unjust practices of the Roman Catholic Church, of which he was a part. While Luther was not the only person calling for an internal reformation of the church, the newly invented printing press allowed his pamphlets to be distributed widely, and they found a ready audience. Luther eventually stood trial at the Diet of Worms and was declared to be a heretic. This marked the first official schism between Protestants and the Roman Catholic Church. In recent years, thanks to the rise of an ecumenical spirit of cooperation and dialogue among Protestants and the Roman Catholic Church, we emphasize the observance and commemoration of these historical events and forthrightly express our desire for reconciliation and unity among Christians. Let us now enter a time of worship. Please join with me in our call to worship, which is based on Psalm 90. God is our dwelling place from year to year, age to age, and yet we become complacent, forgetting who we are, God reforms us and makes prosperous the works of our hands. God's life surges forth through creation like grass that renews every morning, and yet we prefer to be dust, swept away in the wind of every new idea and new fad. God reforms us and makes alive the spirit within us. 
God turns to us and has compassion on us, so the great work of our lives manifests Christ's glorious love to the world. God reforms us and makes abundant the love of our hearts. Let us pray. Wondrous God, 13 billion years ago, your creative spark called creation into being. 2,000 years ago, you lit a spark of new creation in Christ. 500 years ago, your grace reignited the hearts of people with names like Martin Luther, John Calvin, and Ulrich Zwingli. Just when we think all is settled, Everything is finished, closed. Your power and presence explodes onto the scene yet again, bringing newness, bringing life. Fill us with your power and presence, O oh God, so that we may, like our grandparents in faith, carry your truth, your beauty, and your justice 
to the world you so love. In Jesus' name, amen. Today we gather as a people of protest and as a people of peace. Each day, may we both strive for justice and spread the love of God to all of our neighbors. The peace of Christ be with you. Join us here on the steps. Reverend Jerry is going to give our time with children today, so please do come forward. Okay. Yeah. Good morning. What a nice group we have today. This is my first time to do this with the children of Little River. So you're the first. I hope that's OK. <laughs> so you even get to hear me before everybody else does. I hope that's OK. So today is a special day, isn't it, for this holiday that we're going to be celebrating? What is today? Trunk or treat. Is another older name for it? Halloween. Halloween. Yeah. 
That sounds like a spooky celebration, doesn't it? Hallowed even when all the spirits come out. Doesn't that sound spooky? Do you see yards with spooky things in them? Skeletons and cobwebs and giant spiders? Yeah, what else? Witches you... and zombies. Oh, yeah, zombies. Oh, my gosh. The undead creatures. Undead creatures. Well, you know, the wonderful thing about all of that is its imagination. It's imagination we're celebrating. Maybe scary, but it's fun. Isn't it fun to be a little scared a little bit? You know it's okay, but it's fun to be scared. And it's fun to dress up like someone you aren't. Your alternative, that's a big word, another personality. That's not you. That's, that's who you want to be tonight or this afternoon. So it's an exciting time. And I loved doing it when I was your age. And then finally, I got too old to do it. I was sad about that. <laughs> but I loved giving out candy and eating it myself sometimes. I even sampled some of my kids' candy when they went around trick-or-treating. So I was guilty of that. But the nice thing about Halloween, as I said, is imagination. Can you, can you close your eyes and imagine something? Can you close your eyes and think of something different? Something that is not, that might be? Well, I'm opening my eyes now. You want to share anything that you can think of in your imagination? Something new? Yes. There's these really creepy witches at a farm near my house. Oh, yeah? And they have this invisible wire that holds them up, but you can't see, so it looks like they're oh, floating. But they're, oh, they're floating. Oh, that, you don't want to walk under them. <laughs> oh, hi. How you doing? Anything else you thought of in your imagination? Yes? Oh, what was that? Oh, Star Wars, okay. That, that's a wonderful bunch of movies using your imagination to appreciate them. It's scary, too. I mean, these are, those movies were with people in them, so they're acting out some, some difficult situations. Well, anyway. Well, the way we deal with Halloween maybe helps us think about the rest of our life. We can go around and sometimes be surprised by something scary. It could be somebody's dog barking at us, or a, a car tooting a horn, at, and you'd think, is it at me? Is it at someone else? So there are scary things happen in our life, and we want to be able to handle those things. We knew what to do with them. And if you don't know what to do, think of God. You can imagine God. But I think of God, I have to use my imagination, and I do it a, a lot. I'm used to doing it. But I think about God being with me, and with you, even when you don't think about God, God is with you. You're not alone ever. And it, that just thrills me to be able to say that because I believe it in my heart. You're never alone. God is always with you. And whenever you need to think about God, God is there in your thoughts and in your hearts. And you can reach out to other people and even say, I believe God is with us. You're never alone. To me, that's a very important message that I've always believed, and I really appreciate it. Um, I have different ways of speaking to God, and some of my speaking to God is listening. It's important to shut up sometimes and, and listen for God, because God will speak to you in your heart, in your imagination, and don't be afraid of thinking of, of what God might be saying to you how to uh, be with friends, how to be with your family, how to be with yourself. We need to be with ourselves sometimes, right? But not alone, not lonely. That's the important thing, okay? Now, this day is very special because I've never been with you before, and I wanted to leave a gift with the church to honor you. And it's a new book that just came out this week. It's about Walter Brueggemann. Now, that's a hard name to say. It's a very German name. And he was my teacher. He's still living, and he's in his 90s. He was my teacher in 1965. 
and he taught me everything I needed to know about the Old Testament. I've forgotten a lot of it, but I remember some of it. And this is a biography of a, a children's story, a true story of Walter Brueggemann growing up and becoming a famous professor. He's written a hundred books. I can't imagine writing a hundred books. He'd be writing all the time. And he doesn't, isn't sure he wrote enough. <laughs> anyway, I'll leave this for the church in the library. And it says, Walter Bergman's big imagination. So I hope you're curious. And I hope you can get somebody to get the book to you. And you all could probably read it OK over here. It's a biography for children. It's a true story. And it's written by someone who spent a lot of time with Walter Brueggemann. Can you say Walter Brueggemann? Walter, Walter Brueggemann. Brueggemann. Yes, it's a couple G's and a couple N's and it's a lot of syllables. But he's a wonderful man, and I really appreciate him a lot. And I will leave this with you, with the church, and you can go to the library anytime that it's there and you can read it. Maybe you can check it out. So thank you for being with me this morning. Let me have a prayer with you. Let's pray. Loving God, we're grateful for the excitement of this day, celebrating Halloween, trunk or treat, how our imagination is so much fun, and how we're grateful that you are always with us in our imagination, in our life, in our hearts, and with our friends and family and our church. Be with us always as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Go back to your seats. Please join me in prayer. Holy One, we thank you for the wisdom that is found in the words of Scripture. By the power of your Holy Spirit, shine yet more light forth from your Holy Word, reforming us and reconciling us through your freely given grace. This we pray through Jesus Christ. Amen. Our scripture for today comes from Matthew 22 verses 34 to 40, and this version is adapted from the Inclusive Bible. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had left the Sadducees speechless, they gathered together, and one of them, an expert on the law, attempted to trick Jesus with this question. Teacher, what commandment of the law is the greatest? Jesus answered, you must love the Most High God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. The second is like it. You must love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, the whole law is based, and the prophets as well. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Good morning. I have to say I'm really very happy to be here this morning, and I'm honored and humbled by the opportunity and privilege. I, without your knowing it, perhaps, I've always felt like a part of your extended family on the western frontier of Fairfax County <laughs> in Wellspring in Centerville, Virginia. So I'm glad for the contacts we have had over the years, and some of you remember some of those contacts. But I um, do want to share two preliminary things before my sermon. First, in the early 1990s, your associate pastor, the Reverend Susan Gilpin, put forward the idea of a new church start in western Fairfax County. That's where many members of Little River Congregation were living. 
And by 1994, the national UCC agreed to provide funds for starting a church with the Central Atlantic Conference also assisting. And so I came in 1996 to start Wellspring United Church of Christ in Centerville. It already had the name Wellspring, and it al already knew it wanted to be open and affirming of all people regardless of sexual orientation. Thanks to Little River Congregation for contributing people, adults, children, and youth to the founding of Wellspring United Church of Christ in Centerville, the George and Rita Crossman family, the Scott and Mickey Powell family, Marilyn Branscombe, Laurel Patton, uh, the Murphys, and another family I've forgotten the name of, and for two years assisting with church school classes, David and Susan Howard from, well, from Little River. There were financial contributions and prayers and visits that were all extremely helpful, and I thank you again and again. Second, 27 years ago, my wife, Alice, and I came here to worship on Reformation Sunday. That was our first visit here. Coming with us also was our daughter and her newborn son, Francis, one week old. As we were coming in, we were a little bit late, a few minutes, and I correctly predicted the congregation would be singing, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Our grandson was asleep in the carrier, which we placed in front of the pipe organ on the floor. He did not wake up for the entire service. He felt so blessed, I believe. He took in the enthusiastic singing and the inspirational preaching of Vern Aarons, and the warm fellowship of this congregation. Our grandson gifted us this last March with our first great-grandson. Uh, and our great-grandson is a very good-looking kid, I say honestly. <laughs> so thanks for welcoming us again today on this Reformation Sunday. Alice is with me. And the message of our scripture today is really not complicated. It's about loving God and neighbor. What could be simpler than that? And it is in ancient scripture that precedes Jesus' time on earth by many generations, <clears throat> well known by his religious community. So he quoted from Deuteronomy 6. This is from the Inclusive Bible, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Almighty, our God, the Almighty is one. You are to love the Almighty, your God, with all your heart and with all your soul. The Shema, the first two words are Shema Israel, uh, hear, O Israel, are the first two words of a section of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, for the centerpiece of the morning and evening prayer services for every day. What could be more familiar than that passage from Deuteronomy 6? So say it with me. I'll repeat it, and you can say it with me. Hear, O Israel, the Almighty, our God, the Almighty is one, and you are to love the Almighty, your God, with all your heart and with all your soul. I'll do it, the two lines separately. Say it with me. Hear, O Israel, the Almighty, our God, the Almighty is one, and you are to love the Almighty, your God, with all your heart and with all your soul. You are to love the Almighty, your God, with all your heart and with all your soul. In the midst of 613 commandments in the Torah, it might be easy to forget one or two, but not the greatest one. The lawyer questioning Jesus already knew the most important commandment. It was a rhetorical question, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, you are to love the Almighty, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul. So he knew what Jesus was supposed to answer, and Jesus did too. But nobody expected Jesus to add more. He already recited the great commandment that everybody repeated once or twice a day. But Jesus added the verse found from Leviticus. And here it is. He said, the second is like it. Be loving toward your neighbor as one who is like yourself. I am the Almighty. Be loving toward your neighbor as one who is like yourself. I am the Almighty, and you can say it act with me now. Be loving toward your neighbor as one who is like yourself. I am the Almighty. 
If you're really bold, you could say that to your neighbor right now. <laughs> On these two commandments, the whole law is based. 613 commandments, all based on those statements. Popular thinking was that one's relationship with God was one-dimensional. And many people think that way today, between me and God. But Jesus said our relationship with God is two-dimensional. It has to include our relationship with our neighbors. Both dimensions are necessary for either to be authentic and trusted. <clears throat> if someone says they love their neighbor without any relationship to the divine, I would not trust them. If someone says they love God without any concern about neighbor, I would not trust them. Some people who affirm the two dimensions of our life talk about the vertical dynamic, our relationship with God, and the horizontal dimension, our love of neighbor. We need both for authenticity. It completes a cross. For decades, I was in a monthly spiritual direction time with my guide, a good friend. He usually asked me to share at the beginning of our sessions about the health of my soul. It was hard for me to isolate my soul in descriptive ways that made sense and was honest. My soul for me is who I am, Jerry Fultz, with a combined relationship with people and with God. So that relationship has not always been an even one. There's a lot of variety to it and often not even thought about. I just live life and live it out. But I've lived as best as I can. And when I know a need my neighbor has, even if it's a need to say hello, I do that. And if it's something else I can do, I try to do that. And I'm grateful for it, both with God and with my neighbor. And as I said, I believe that God is always with me, even though I don't always think about God. A fellow pastor once described the hymns of, or songs in church that he did not like as when he had to pick out songs to sing, songs that were focused on me, my, and mine, very personal, individual songs. When I can, I change the words of songs. I might want to use words like we and our and ours when it works. <clears throat> and in the time of the Catholic monk, Martin Luther, the burdens of faith were many. His guilt over his sinful nature was nearly debilitating, and he had to protest with all the pressures on him personally. And a few years ago, Alice and I journeyed to Wittenberg, Germany, and came to the door of the university chapel. And there on the door was a 95 Theses in German by Martin Luther. I noted that the theses were in solid bronze. Nailing that to the door had to be no small task. <laughs> I also learned recently that there's some doubt that he actually put anything like that on the door, even in paper. But he sent them written, authentically, to another religious leader who, to start a debate on many of the current practices from selling indulgences for someone's forgiveness and salvation, protesting that the Pope was getting rich off the poor people, to the differential between poverty and wealth might remind some of us of our situation in the world today, even in our country. <clears throat> What Luther started resulted in more than a theological intellectual debate. He was pricking the most powerful institution of his day. Was he obscenely brave or just obscenely desperate or both? It resulted in a revolution that we call the Protestant Reformation. And we still have work to do about it. My seminary professor, Walter Brueggemann, I mentioned earlier to the kids, his teachings were profound. He is considered an outstanding expert on the Old Testament. He's written over 100 books. He spoke on the mistranslation to us in that first year, 1965, of Habakkuk, a book that we very seldom spend much time studying. Because this verse in Habakkuk was quoted by Paul in Romans, and there's 
the translation of Habakkuk, it's usually not correct, he said, and plus Paul misquotes it. And here's the difference. Habakkuk says the righteous are saved by God's faithfulness, not just saved by faith. That sounds like our faith. It's saved by God's faithfulness. That's where it comes from. He's the author of salvation. And further, it was misquoted then by Paul in Romans, the one who is just through faith will live, but it's through God's faithfulness. I marked that in a Bible that's so worn out I had to discard it, that passage from Habakkuk. So look at Habakkuk sometime if you want to try to find it. Chapter 2, verse five, 4. It's not hard to find. The just live by God's faithfulness. That speaks to Luther, as far as I'm concerned, and to the rest of us. Salvation is by God's faithfulness to all humankind. There is no other way or source of salvation, no matter what someone says. Someone might say the Bible makes it clear. Well, no, the Bible is not clear at all. But this passage, to me, is very clear. That's, you can do, pick out some of it. Paul Tillich, a theologian in the last century, wrote that the only thing necessary to do is to accept that you're accepted. That should be an unburdening of people. Just accept that you're accepted. It warms me, it chills me both. <laughs> Luther taught that salvation is by the grace of God, not by any works, not by anything we do. That message is at the heart of the Reformation, the church's own revolution that has continuing meaning as well as division, because we all don't think alike, do we? As today's theme is not just Reformation, but also reconciliation, I'm reminded that in the first half of the 19th century, there was an effort in the German Reformed Church to seek reconciliation with the Catholic Church. That was called the Mercersburg Theology. You can look it up on the internet. Google will tell you a lot about it. And there's still a, a group or a club or a network of Mercersburg theologians. Uh, it was uh, Schaff and uh, uh, Nevin who promoted that idea. Not that we'd become Catholic, but there must be a resolution, a reconciliation that could combine the two communions after all the bloodshed and the fighting and the anger and the separations of countries and states in Europe. There must be a way to reconcile. Well, we're still working at it. Maybe not call it the Mercersburg theology, we're calling it ecumenicity. And I've been an ecumaniac all my life. <laughs> a few years ago, my wife and I visited her cousin and husband in Dallas, Texas, Together, we went to the fairly new Holocaust Museum. They had not seen it. And after touring the exhibits and hearing explanations of the atrocities in videos and displays of the Jews, especially, but also others of different kinds of people and different categories of people and different labels that people had, millions of people slaughtered, murdered, tortured. We came to the concluding part of the exhibit. There we heard what was for me a new saying that I've never forgotten, and I've preached about it. We heard that there are three kinds of people in the world besides the victims in our world. There are the perpetrators, there are the bystanders, and then there are the upstanders. Thank God for the upstanders. We need to be upstanders if we are to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. As, a, as upstanders, we have to consider and pay attention to the conflict with Israel and Palestine and the wider area there. As complicated as it is historically and geographically and even politically and religiously. I ask your indulgence in sharing with you a statement this past week from our Centerville Immigration Forum where I'm chair of the board of directors. <clears throat> Currently in Israel, Palestine, and Gaza, we see mass atrocities being held publicly with very little accountability for human rights and international law. <clears throat> in line with our local advocacy 
that all people deserve the same dignity and access to justice, we extend the same advocacy to the international community. We urge you to call on our national leaders to act for justice because our rights are ensured only when they are unequivocally enforced for all people. We condemn the use of force on civilians, along with mass displacement and collective punishment, and we urge our supporters and friends to stand up for the rights of each individual. The core values of the Senate Immigration Forum are equity and justice for all. We serve immigrants from many parts of the world. Our members left living conditions of political unrest, violence, and poverty, and they came here to provide safe lives for themselves and their families. Our social responsibility is to ensure that each individual has access to opportunities and to break down barriers to justice. Maya Angelou also said, the truth is no one of us can be free until everybody is free. And finally, as we profess the love of God and neighbor, we need to be aware of the action alert of our own United Church of Christ. And we ask members of Congress, in summary, to publicly call for a ceasefire, de-escalation and restraint by all sides. We call on all parties to abide by the laws of war, including the Geneva Convention and customary international law, and prioritize steps to secure immediate release of hostages and ensure protection for civilians. In this very day, it may seem impossible to accomplish those, and yet we have to keep trying. There are interfaith groups such as Jewish Voice for Peace and the UCC Palestine Israel Network, UCC PIN. You can find them easily on the internet, and they provide daily information for us. For the love of neighbor and of God, let us be upstanders. For the sake of Jesus, let us be upstanders on this Reformation Reconciliation Sunday. Amen. Amen. Oh, before I sit down, the other book I'm donating to your library is the whole biography of Walter Brueggemann. <laughs> <laughs> you will fall in love with him when you read this. So let your imagination soar. It's an easy read, and I've been in touch with the author. He so impresses me. So I'll leave it in your library.
The great Swiss theologian Karl Barth once said that grace and gratitude go together like heaven and earth. The way of Jesus Christ is the life lived in gratitude for the God who has created us and claimed us as her own. In gratitude for God's gifts, let's give back to God our gifts of time, talent, and treasure for the divine mission in the world. Please pray with me. God, receive our gifts. Use them to reform this community of faith as you remake the world in your own image. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God, we give you thanks that we may gather each week and share with you and one another our hearts. Thank you for your presence and the healing that we receive through your love, expressed and embodied by those among us. This week we pray with the Ecumenical Church for Canada and the United States. We are thankful for the vast expanse of North America with its resources and varied landscapes, May they be preserved, enjoyed, and used wisely. We are grateful for those who are its original inhabitants, First Nations and Native Americans. And we give thanks for organizations that strongly advocate for social and racial justice, those that provide for new immigrants and refugees today, as well as for others who are poor and vulnerable. We pray for indigenous peoples in their long struggles for survival, land and rights, and for ongoing healing and reconciliation which, with those who have come after them. We pray for new immigrants, that they will continue to be welcomed in these countries, and that policies will serve the common good. Finally, we pray for government leaders that they would advance racial justice, human rights, and peace for all within these countries and in the rest of the world. God of grace on this Reformation Reconciliation Sunday, we give you thanks for the saints who have gone before us, for those who faced trouble and trial and even death for the sake of the message of your mercy. We pray especially for those who now face trouble, trial, and even death, for those members of the body of Christ who face persecution, for your beloved children everywhere, regardless of tradition, who live under the threat of religious persecution. We pray that all may hear the good news of the Prince of Peace in ways that resonate and cause us to drop our weapons and our defenses for the sake of the kingdom. We pray that you may help us not only walk in the shoes of our forebears, but fill them. May all of us gathered here today be as captivated by the life you have given us in Christ that we are freed to reach our friends, our neighbors, and our enemies with your unconditional love. God, we pray for the world you love in hope and in trust, that we and your church might carry the light that has been passed down through the centuries, so we might be a beacon of your love to the world. And now let us pray together as Jesus taught us, saying, our God, in whom is heaven, Blessed be your name. Your presence come, your will be done, both here and everywhere. May your realm of peace and freedom sustain our hopes and come on earth. May we be fed today with the bread that we need, and may forgiveness be ours in the same measure we give. In times of temptation, strengthen us, from the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen.
go out into the world, living in the light of Christ. By the power of the Spirit, do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. And now may the grace of our brother Jesus Christ, the love of the Holy One, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be yours this day and every other one. Amen. Thank you.